here for the battle walk. Why don't you gather around in the grass? We'll get started. As soon as the clock tower stops. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> I take it the fact that you're all here means that it's yeah. not an hour late. All right, everybody. Well, I'd like to welcome all of you to Gettysburg National Military Park and to our Battle Walk program. Uh, this is a, a two-hour walking tour, and we are going to cover a, a fair bit of ground today. Um, so I just want to warn you of that up front. Uh, you're going to want to have good footwear, um, <laughs> probably sneakers, um, but you know, strong sandals will be probably okay. We're not going to be going through any you know neck deep grass. I'm not <laughs> Troy Harmon okay. for <laughs> our battle walk regulars. Um, we will uh, stick mostly uh, to uh, cut grass today. We won't be going through any of the fields. But we will be covering a lot of ground, so I'd recommend bringing some water. And uh, if at any point you do need to step off the program, please do not hesitate to do so. I will not be offended uh, in the least. Uh, today we are going to be talking about the 147th New York Regiment. Uh, and they uh, are a regiment who makes uh, essentially an important stand out on the battlefield in front of us. <coughs> hundred yards away, uh, all on their own. Uh, they're very much left all out on their own, uh, vastly uh, outnumbered, and uh, they will sacrifice uh, themselves uh, out on the field, buying important amounts of time. If you're familiar with the story of the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, in many ways, I think the story of the 147th New York on July 1st is similar to the story of the 1st Minnesota Regiment on the second day of the battle. They're really out there all alone. Uh, they endure tremendous casualties, but this is a story uh, that is really, uh, in large part, overlooked, along with most of the first day's battle. And uh, I hope as we walk through uh, in their footsteps for the next two hours and talk about the combat that they experienced here, uh, that you will see uh, that the sacrifice of the 147th New York uh, shows us that the fighting here on July 1st was very serious that it was very consequential uh, as well. And it has lasting significance for our country. Uh, this was not simply a meeting engagement on July 1st. This was a full, intense day of battle. And the soldiers in the 147th New York uh, certainly experienced the brunt of it. And this was their very first experience of combat, by and large. That will make their performance here uh, all the more remarkable. So we're going to start here at the Lutheran Seminary because this is in large part where they arrived. They were part of the brigade of Lysander Cutler who started the war. Uh, it was uh, the colonel of the 6th Wisconsin. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the 6th Wisconsin for their famous charge uh, on the railroad cut. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but Cutler commanded their brigade here. His brigade consisted of the 7th Indiana who was away from the brigade on July 1st. And then uh, the 95th New York and the 14th Brooklyn, who participated in the charge of the railroad cut with the 6th Wisconsin, uh, they will be near the McPherson Farm Buildings, where we'll go to on our second stop. And then also uh, the other three regiments, uh, the 147th New York, the 56th Pennsylvania, and the 76th New York, uh, will all participate in fighting on the right side of the Chambersburg Pike, the right side of the railroad cut. And that will primarily be the combat that we will focus on. But Cutler's brigade is in large part kind of divided in half early on the morning, and that is because they are the very first troops to arrive here on the field. Uh, because Auto Tour Stop 1 is out at McPherson Ridge, right in front of Herbst Woods, a lot of people assume automatically that the Iron Brigade uh, are the first Union troops on the field. But in large part, the 147th New York and the rest of Cutler's brigade are the very first ones here. And they will be fighting uh, before the Iron Brigade really goes into position. And that's going to make their fighting extremely important. Uh, before we move to where they fought, uh, I do want to give you just a little bit of background on this regiment. They were from Oswego, New York, recruited all around the county. In large part, uh, they were almost entirely 
uh, ethnically German or Irish, one or the other. Many of them were probably uh, immigrants. It's a, an important reminder by the end of the war, about 20% of the entire Union Army will be immigrants. About the same percentage as in the Confederate Army would be slaveholders. So, but this regiment will be uh, pretty much uh, an ethnic regiment, one company Irish, one company German, uh, by and large. Uh, they would be uh, mustered into service on September 22nd and September 23rd of 1862. So that's one of the reasons why this will be their uh, first battle. Uh, they were not one of the uh, initial regiments formed. They're formed later on in 1862. Uh, they would initially be sent to Washington, D.C., and kind of sent uh, into the Civil War defenses, all the forts around Washington, D.C., to guard them. And that was pretty boring uh, duty. You would not get a lot of good experience, uh, combat experience, if you were posted in D.C., uh, at one point, they were reviewed by President Lincoln and Secretary of State William Seward, but by and large, this was a low point for the regiment. Uh, their commanders, their officers, did not have much military experience at all. They were not uh, very good at instilling discipline. They were not good at training this regiment. And uh, morale was pretty low uh, when they were in the D.C. defenses. They were sent out and uh, joined the Union Army by the time of the Battle of Fredericksburg, but they were away from much of the significant fighting, so they really did not see any significant combat at Fredericksburg. Uh, and in March of 1863, uh, things would begin to turn around a little bit for them because they would be added to Cutler's Brigade. Uh, that's one of the interesting things that the Union Army does a lot more than the Confederate Army is they move regiments uh, around and kind of are constantly shuffling brigades and that makes it hard uh, to really form strong unit cohesion uh, but it would be good for the 147th New York because Cutler uh, very much formed them into a fighting regiment. He was able to instill a sense of discipline into them that would serve them well here on the battlefield at Gettysburg. They would see very minimal action at Chancellorsville. They were again away from most of the action. A few people were wounded uh, but they did not see serious fighting. Uh, and after the Battle of Chancellorsville, things would again really begin to improve for the 147th New York because many of these officers who had initially led them, who were not uh, trained, who had no real military experience, many of them uh, essentially resigned and went home, and so uh, including their colonel. And so command of the regiment would fall to Lieutenant Colonel Francis Miller. And he was one of the few officers, uh, along with uh, Major George Harney, two of the main figures who we'll talk about today. They were uh, some of the few who had had prior military experience. And so the, the 147th New York would come into Gettysburg finally uh, with some good training and some discipline instilled by Cutler, their brigade commander, and also with some able and competent officers. And that would really make uh, all the difference for them here. On July 1st, uh, they were camped uh, at Marsh Creek, uh, south of Gettysburg, along the Emmitsburg Road. And uh, many of you know the story of how the Battle of Gettysburg opened with General John Buford's cavalry uh, fighting on the ridges to the west of town here, attempting to delay the Confederate advance from the west with Buford essentially trading space for time uh, out on the ridges to the west of us here. Uh, the key question on the early morning hours of July 1st is whether or not Buford will be able to buy enough time for the Union infantry to arrive here. Uh, they will, uh, Cutler's Brigade will be the very first ones uh, to arrive here on the field. As we said, they'll be moving quickly uh, up uh, the Emmitsburg Road. Cutler wrote in his official report on the battle, he said, the brigade, excepting the 7th Indiana, which was on duty in the rear, moved from camp early on the 1st, being the leading brigade of the Corps on towards Gettysburg. One of the soldiers in the 147th noted that Cutler was always an early riser, and that meant that they were too. They were on the road very early. They were moving quickly. Uh, one soldier, Lieutenant uh, J. Volney Pierce, who leaves us an excellent account of the 147th's experience here at Gettysburg, uh, would write of that morning, uh, years later, he said, my breakfast was too hardtack 
and a tin of black coffee. This was my fighting meal, and the only one until July 4th. And we'll talk about why uh, many of these soldiers, after their combat experience on July 1st, did not get to eat for the next few days of battle. Uh, but imagine getting on the road early, two crackers essentially, and a cup of coffee. And you're going to be fighting uh, for most of the day on that, fighting on an empty stomach. Their chaplain uh, recollected that years later, uh, we were being hurried along the road with utmost speed on that hot July morning. Everyone knew uh, that the race to Gettysburg essentially uh, was on. And as they arrived here at the Emmitsburg Road, they, when they got near the Kadori Farm, if you've uh, been on the Emmitsburg Road, you probably know uh, where the Kadori Farm is. When they got to the Kadori Farm right near the edge of town, uh, they began to uh, move across the fields towards the direction of the seminary here. Cutler said as we approached and when within about two miles of the town, I was ordered to move obliquely left across the fields to the ridge near the seminary. Again, that's why we're going to start here because this was where Cutler's men began to get a sense of the battlefield. They had heard it on their way up. One soldier uh, remembered the distant reports of artillery tingled the ear as we marched up the Emmitsburg Pike. They knew full well what they were heading into, but it would be when they arrived here that they would begin to get their first glimpses of the combat here. So as they begin to move into position, uh, they begin to advance through the low ground between the two ridges, Seminary Ridge here, and the first part of McPherson Ridge. And so what we'll do now is we'll walk down the path, begin to move through that low ground. Uh, this program will be tr about as much as possible trying to walk in their footsteps and let them tell it in their own words. This program will be a little more quote heavy than I usually like to do, but I think it's important uh, to try to do this on a two hour program because the combat that we'll be talking about by and large will be over in about 30 minutes. Uh, we'll move around with them as they moved around for the rest of the day and they would fight a little bit for the rest of the day. Uh, but in taking uh, two hours to try to describe largely 30 minutes of combat, I want to try to slow it down by letting them tell it in their own words and walking in their footsteps. So what we'll do now is we'll walk down the path here. It looks like uh, we don't have anyone coming, so we can begin to up here, just kind of gather the group before we begin to move. We're going to move right along up this fence line here, staying as close to it as we can. You'll see where that yellow uh, kind of post is sticking up. There's a, a little you know, creek bed drainage uh, ditch essentially that runs through that area. I don't think most of you in sneakers will be able to go across. So we will kind of have to go up and around. Like I said, I'll stand on the road and try to make sure uh, that if anyone gets hit, it's me. Uh, but it basically make sure the traffic is paying attention. But I do want to stop here also and point out just kind of the lay of the land. This area between Seminary Ridge and the first ridge of McPherson Ridge gives you an excellent idea of what the terrain is like uh, here uh, between, uh, you know, here and out to Hare Ridge and beyond where Buford and his men are conducting their fighting withdrawal, moving from ridgeline to ridgeline. It doesn't look like much, but when you stand down here, you can see that if you had to move from the low ground to uh, the high ground uh, with, you know, under fire, that uh, it is a, you know, considerable distance to move. Also, I wanted to pause here to not just orient us to the lay of the land, but to point out uh, one of the things that happened to the 147th New York uh, that will really impact the way the fighting begins to unfold here is that the 147th New York, as they were getting ready to cross the Chambersburg Pike, uh, essentially had a whole second main artillery battery move between them and wait. Second main artillery battery moved between them and the 56th Pennsylvania and the 76th New York. And so they got caught on the other side as all the horses pulling these cannons and the ammunition uh, as they were moving through. Uh, some of the soldiers described Hall's battery as coming tearing through, trying to rapidly move into position. One of the things that was particularly dire 
for the Union cavalry and the Union uh, infantry going into position out there was that the Confederates had far more artiller artillery out on the battlefield further out. Uh, Buford had just one artillery battery of around six guns. Uh, the second main artillery battery, when they're going in, they're largely replacing those six guns who are going to have to be pulled off the line. So it's important that the Union artillery get into position as quickly as possible. And uh, they are going to slow down the movement of the 147th New York and kind of isolate them from the 56th uh, Pennsylvania and the 76th New York. And that will impact the way the fighting will continue to unfold. But the 147th New York, when they do finally go into battle, will go into position supporting the second main battery. So as we move, we'll go uh, up the ridge, uh, up the, along the side of the road here. We'll crest the ridge and we'll go down a little bit to the McPherson property and at least try to establish a visual of where Hall's second main battery would be because that'll be really important as we talk about the position of the 147th New York. So we'll move now and uh, just be very careful along the road. The approximate location uh, that the 147th New York moved to uh, while they were kind of awaiting more specific orders about where they were supposed to be. Uh, as we said, they were coming, uh, the first infantry to arrive on the field, they knew they were supposed to go west to support uh, the cavalry. Uh, General John Reynolds, who commanded uh, the Union First Corps, rode ahead of all of his men uh, to survey the battlefield, to communicate with John Buford directly about the situation on the battlefield. And uh, when Cutler's men arrived, Cutler's men were part of uh, General uh, James Wadsworth's division. So I think it would be helpful if you're new to the Battle of Gettysburg to talk a little bit about the structures of the armies, just so you can know kind of how zoomed in we are going to be on this program. But these two armies, the Confederate uh, Army of Northern Virginia and the Union Army of the Potomac, the largest building block of these two armies are the Army Corps. Typically, they're around 10,000 men. Confederate Corps will be a little bit larger. The building blocks of the Army Corps will be divisions, usually a few thousand men, three to 5,000 men typically. Uh, and then uh, brigades will be the building block of divisions, usually between 1,000 and 2,000 men. Some large brigades might be a little bit larger, some very small brigades might be a little bit smaller, but typically between 1,000 and 2,000 men. Uh, regiments are the building blocks of brigades. So we're going to be focusing in on one narrow building block of the first day's battle. And uh, keeping that in mind, I'm going to try to pause at points and connect our little building block to the big picture story. Sometimes uh, we tend to lose the forest for the trees, and I want to try to avoid that on this program to talk about how the 147th New York, their specific actions, contribute to the big picture. Uh, but Reynolds uh, would ride ahead and uh, when he would see Wadsworth and the men who were arriving uh, as the first on the field, uh, Reynolds would direct uh, Wadsworth to position a few regiments uh, to the support of Hall's battery, essentially to the right of Hall's battery over there. And Reynolds would say faithfully that I will see to the left. Reynolds essentially will claim this part of the battlefield as his own personal a place where he will oversee the placement of troops. And I say faithfully because General Reynolds will be killed here just a few minutes after that conversation, no more than half an hour later, uh, helping to place troops uh, in Herbst Woods over there. He'd be struck by a bullet behind the ear and killed instantly. He would be the highest ranking uh, Union officer killed here on the battlefields at Gettysburg. His death would be very consequential uh, because his judgment was highly trusted by General Meade. Meade trusted him to come here to determine the suitability of Gettysburg as a place to fight a battle. And when he uh, is killed, uh, it's very unclear what exactly uh, his intentions were. Uh, he will be succeeded in command by General Abner Doubleday, who I always point out did not invent baseball. It's an absolute myth. 
If Doubleday was in Cooperstown, New York in 1839 when it was said that he invented baseball, he would have been in big trouble at West Point, New York. Uh, but Doubleday, where he should have been and was, uh, but Doubleday would take command of uh, the first corps, and it, was, uh, it would seem that he always believed that it was Reynolds' intentions to hold this part of the battlefield because Reynolds uh, initially placed troops here. But when you look at what Reynolds was doing, who he was uh, interacting with, what he was saying in those interactions, it becomes pretty clear that he is essentially joining Buford and supporting the Union effort to simply buy time for the rest of the Union Army to arrive here if he wants. Uh, but he will direct uh, part of Cutler's command to go into support of Hall's battery. And we cannot see, uh, well, we can see, if you look at that group up there, you can see just uh, the tops of the cannons uh, to the left of the monument and uh, the very tops of the wheels. Near that group, there's a fence line. If you kind of trace from the cannons and the group along the top of the fence line that you can just kind of see, poking up there. Hall's battery will stretch from the road here to the railroad cut where the trees are essentially all along that fence line. So the rest of Cutler's command is already across uh, the way. Uh, those three regiments, I should say, uh, the, the 95th New York and the 14th Brooklyn will deploy uh, facing west from the McPherson farm. Reynolds will take them and put them on the left. But the 147th New York as we said, kind of gets caught over here, and they're not exactly certain where they're supposed to be. So Lieutenant Colonel Miller brought them here along a picket fence line near the McPherson farm, uh, near the barn, it was said. One of the uh, soldiers of the 147th New York talked about taking refuge in the basement of the barn at one point. Miller, it appears, would ride off and try to find more specific orders about where exactly they were supposed to be and he received orders to go in specifically on the right of Hall's battery. And that's going to take them over the railroad cut. So uh, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Pierce recalled uh, that Lieutenant Colonel Miller returned and ordered us by flank to the right at a double quick in rear of Hall's battery, now in position on the third ridge. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move in their approximate footsteps. They would not go directly, but they would move along the ridge line here, it appears. And uh, we'll see the railroad cut, get an idea for how big an obstacle it is, and then move as far forward as we can. Obviously, you can see the fields out there are pretty thick. I don't think we can walk through them, uh, but I was out there yesterday, and I think we can get kind of close to the ridge line where they fought. Uh, but we'll move now along the way. If you have any questions, answer them. We will have to cross the pike uh, at one point. So uh, what I'm going to do is we'll wait until the light uh, turns red and we'll try to cross together. Do you have a question, sir? Yeah, when all this is going on, has Buford already pulled out? Uh, it appears that Buford uh, was at the very least beginning to pull out. It's one of the interesting things that I think helps us get a little bit of a visual for uh, how, where exactly the Confederates are when Buford and his men uh, begin to withdraw because the Union infantry is here. Because obviously, Hall's battery goes into position pretty far forward. And uh, that would suggest that the Confederates were still fairly far away. So it's hard to tell just exactly, you know, parts of Buford's line are. Certainly, Archer's men are probably a little closer over on that side of the field as part of Buford's command pulls back here. Uh, but yeah, it does help us, you know, to to get an idea of where exactly Buford's men were. Yeah. What's your opinion about where the rest of Cutler's brigade is in relation to the uh, 47th? Uh, the 7th Indiana is way south, uh, but the 95th New York and the 14th Brooklyn, I think they're probably along the fence line facing west, and they'll eventually change front uh, for the charge on the railroad cut. But I think there are others on the other side. Yeah, the 56 and the, the 76. Yeah, we'll talk about that where they are when we get over there. Because um, they're uh, a little bit further back, I think, than the 147. Any York. reason that they didn't move up to the same ridge line? Why they didn't move up to the yeah. same ridge line? Uh, I'm not sure. We'll talk a, a little bit about that. Um, it's hard to tell exactly. When you look at the lay of the land, it's it's hard to see. We'll we'll try to visualize it a little bit when we get over there. But we'll move now and uh, cross yeah, the river. Getting out. Why they're a little farther back. Uh, it's a little harder to see from down here. I didn't want to just occupy the road, though, 
Uh, but you can see uh, the 147th will go into line on that ridge out in front of us. So uh, the crest there, you can visualize it with the fence that we pointed out where Hall's battery is. Uh, when you're, especially when you're up higher, you can see that that ridge kind of dips a little bit on the part of the line that the 56th and uh, 76th were uh, as far right. This is probably a little higher. They also got you know separated a little bit from uh, the 147th, so they were kind of isolated to begin with. They also uh, they would cross further back and they would go into battle lines uh, a little earlier, so that may slow their movement a little bit. Uh, but also, I think that they might not have been uh, as uh, closely directed to tie themselves very closely to Hall's battery. They're obviously part of the, the units that Reynolds wants in support, uh, but they can kind of afford to be in support a little bit further back. Whereas if the 147th New York was back here, Hall's battery is particularly isolated. So I think that, does that kind of get it? Why the 56 and the 76 might be a little bit further back? All right. There we go. So we'll move forward now. Just be careful. There should be some room over this way. You don't have to stand in that. Don't, don't, want, any, don't want anyone to have to stand where, uh, where it's going to be prickly. Okay, so... Uh, we're kind of between the two ridge lines. I think this is a really helpful place to stand because you begin to get uh, the impression that there are a couple uh, McPherson's Ridge, at least. In various accounts on this part of the fighting, uh, you'll see sometimes even people referring uh, up to the third ridge. But there's definitely at least two ridges, the ridges behind us and the ridge in front of us. And I think, you know, as you get closer to, you know, McPherson Ridge and the seminary, uh, you can, you know, see how someone standing there would look at it and kind of count three distinct ridges. Uh, at the time of the battle, this was uh, a wheat field. So uh, I had no idea what the crops was, uh, what the crop was today until I was told. Uh, but it was a wheat field at the time of the battle. Uh, all the accounts suggest that it was pretty ripe and pretty tall. So we're not moving through chest high fields, uh, but it appears that the 147th New York probably was. Uh, just to orient ourselves again, you can see the fence line there, the group, the cannons, uh, representing the approximate position of Hall's battery, stretching from the Chambersburg Pike to the railroad cut here. Uh, also from here, I, I love standing here because you get a sense uh, of just how uh, different the lay of the land of the railroad cut can be depending on where you are when we crossed on the bridge It's deep and you begin to get you know when you think about the charge of the railroad cut you begin to think why would anyone uh, Move into the railroad cut, but when you stand here and kind of look how shallow it is here You really do get the impression of why the railroad cut appeared to be such an attractive defensive position and the railroad cut would really impact uh, the fighting here uh, at, for the 147th New York, in particular, as they begin to withdraw, uh, the lay of the land of the railroad cut will really impact their withdrawal. You can also see here, hopefully from the ridge and here, that it is very hard to see what lies beyond. There probably wouldn't have been quite as much woods, uh, but it is very difficult to get the lay of the land. Uh, the accounts from soldiers in all three regiments, the 147th, the 56th Pennsylvania, and the 76th New York, talk about how we really didn't see the enemy until they were very, uh, very close. Uh, one uh, soldier wrote, uh, where the 147th was posted was a field of wheat, and we could see nothing and did not know where the rebels were till they fired a volley into our ranks and could only tell then by the way the wheat was moving in front of us by their bullets. Uh, so it appears even when they crest to the ridge it was very hard for them to tell the position of the enemy. Uh, in particular it's even harder uh, given kind of the lay of the land over there for the 56th Pennsylvania and the 76th New York. Uh, the colonel, uh, the, the major in command of the 76th New York would say that when they began to be fired on, he was certain that it was friendly fire. 
uh, and he actually had his men withhold uh, responding until they had received a couple, couple of volleys. And then they realized that this had to be the enemy. It could not be an incident of friendly fire. But this fighting here is pretty confusing. You can see how the lay of the land, especially with a, a tall uh, wheat field, would be very confusing. Uh, Lieutenant Pierce, who wrote an excellent account, who will draw on for a lot of the quotes here, he said, while we were advancing in the wheat field, the battle opened on our right, and the bullets from the enemy were flying thick and fast as we marched rapidly towards our opponents. The wheat heads fell with rapid noddings as the bullets from the Confederate line began their harvest of death. So the, uh, the Confederates will be coming from beyond the ridge line and their line will extend pretty far to the right. Uh, the brigade opposing them will be commanded by uh, General Joseph Davis. Uh, Joe Davis was the nephew of Confederate President Jefferson Davis. And uh, both of them, both Jefferson Davis and Joe Davis, were pretty active in the uh, Mississippi State Militia prior to the Civil War. And when war uh, broke out, Joe Davis will become a captain in a Mississippi regiment. Uh, he'll begin to work his way up through the ranks. And eventually his uncle uh, will work pretty hard at trying to get him an appointment as a brigadier general. And it would stall, interestingly, in the Confederate Senate. The Confederate Senate would not give approval for Joe Davis uh, because they feared that his position was really uh, one more of nepotism rather than uh, an earned one uh, based on field experience. Uh, but uh, he would be in command finally here uh, at the Battle of Gettysburg. This will be one of his first tests in command, and he'll have three regiments uh, with him. One regiment in reserve, so kind of like Cutler, who has one regiment way in reserve, and then Cutler has two others away here, but you'll have three regiments opposing three regiments here. Uh, Davis's uh, line from left to right will be the 42nd Mississippi on, his, uh, on our left, essentially his right, but our left. The second Mississippi in the middle, and then to our far right will be the 55th North Carolina. Even though you do have three regiments opposing three regiments, uh, Davis's uh, units are a little bit larger, and Davis has a pretty sizable advantage in numbers. So uh, the 147th will be here kind of on the left end of Cutler's line, uh, but the 42nd Mississippi will extend a little bit beyond the line of the 147th, and the 55th North Carolina in the fields beyond us will really extend farther uh, than the 70, uh, 76th New York's line. And that will be what will create uh, the most problems for, uh, for Cutler's three regiments here and for the 147th New York uh, later. They would advance, as we said, farther. Uh, out to the crest of the ridge than the, the 56 Pennsylvania and the 76 New York. We talked about why that probably was, the fact that they had been separated, that they had entered into line of battle earlier and were a little bit farther away from Hall's battery. But already the uh, 147th New York will be kind of isolated. That's really the story of their initial fight, that they end up all on their own. One of the things that it's hard to get a sense of but it would be important for how the fighting would play out is a, a fence line that runs from uh, the other side of the road would continue at the time of the battle uh, in the middle of this field. And the 147th would initially have some of their companies deployed on the right side of that fence. Uh, so that, would, uh, that fence would be an important piece of uh, the terrain that because they now uh, plant this field and harvest it, obviously they don't want a large fence. Uh, in the middle of it, but uh, keep in mind that there would have been a fence running effectively through the middle of this field. Uh, Pierce uh, would continue to write, we continued to advance in the nodding wheat of death until our left touched the railroad cut supporting Hall's battery. So they will use the railroad cut as uh, some cover to their advantage. Back where they are, uh, the railroad cut is deep enough that you can't actually move easily through the railroad cut and get uh, to the end of their line. So out along the crest of the ridge, the railroad cut will give them some advantage. 
and uh, Captain Henry Lyman would write, the fighting was at very short range and very destructive. As we said, they couldn't really see the enemy until they got out there, and the enemy was very close. And Pierce would note that in the early stage of this fighting, uh, as they became engaged with the soldiers of the 42nd Mississippi and probably some of the 2nd Mississippi, that Captain Nathaniel Wright stood behind him near the rear, pounding the ground and yelled, uh, give them hell uh, to his soldiers and his command. So the fighting was pretty intense already out there. And as we said, problems will begin to develop for Cutler in large part because he's outnumbered. Uh, he's two, two of his regiments, as we said, were detached over there. They're supporting the line near Herbst Woods as the Iron Brigade begins to move towards the battle, uh, the battlefield. Keep in mind, the Iron Brigade is not here yet. Cutler's men are the only infantry on the field at this point, and they're responsible for checking uh, the Confederate advance uh, here along the lines. As General Wadsworth, the division commander, so Cutler's immediate senior, as he was observing the battle unfold out here after about 10, 15, at most 20 minutes, uh, he began to see that things were not going to end well for Cutler and his men. The 55th North Carolina in particular uh, was just way too far out. Uh, well overlapped their lines and was beginning to turn and beginning to move on to their flank. And when that happens, uh, it's not going to be long before the line will give way. And so uh, they're going to be firing into the flank of the 76th New York, probably near the crest of this first ridge line here. So already they're kind of behind the 147th New York. Keep that in mind as well. But Wadsworth would see this and Wadsworth would give the order for the three regiments to withdraw back to Seminary Ridge, approximately where the wood line is. The wood line today probably extends a little bit too far forward, uh, but you can use it as an approximate visualization. Cutler, uh, Wadsworth will see the trouble and will say, we've got to fall back. And he'll even initially uh, begin to give the order uh, to have them fall back all the way to the town and begin to barricade uh, the streets. And because of that, uh, there's some debate. Uh, some people will criticize Cutler's men and will paint the picture that they fled essentially from the battlefield in absolute chaos and disorder, particularly the 76 New York and the 56 Pennsylvania. I'm not sure that that's fair. Uh, you have some conflicting accounts. You can certainly see how that would be the case. Uh, but in a very early letter, an 1865 letter to John Batchelder, who's one of the earliest historians of the Battle of Gettysburg, who's really responsible for shaping the initial development uh, of the memorial uh, of the battlefield. And uh, an 1865 letter to him said that General Cutler received an order to fall back to the town and barricade the streets. And the order to fall back in line of battle was given, but before crossing the flat from the Seminary Ridge to the town, however, this order was countermanded. Essentially, it was scrapped, and he was told to remain on Seminary Ridge. That could possibly be why some people get the impression and will say that parts of Cutler's command were as far back as the town. I'm not sure uh, that you can defend, regardless of how you know, chaotic this retreat was, I'm not sure you can defend the, the, the position that Cutler and his men essentially turned tails and ran all the way to the town. The evidence does not seem to suggest that. You may have a, a, a rare few, but I think it's pretty clear they pull back in some manner of chaos, as all retreats inevitably are, towards the line on the uh, on Seminary Ridge there. Lieutenant Colonel Miller, in command of the 147th New York here, will receive the order to withdraw. But almost immediately after he is uh, receives this order, uh, he will be wounded and will not be able to relay this order and it was not heard by anyone else uh, in command. Uh, Pierce would recollect, he said, Lieutenant Colonel Miller received a wound in the head and his frightened horse carried him from the field. And on Major George Harney, 
the duty fell to command. None more worthy than he. We said early on that Miller and Harney were two of the only officers in the 147th who had any military experience. Uh, so they were, they were ably and competently led here, but Miller would be pretty badly wounded. I do believe he survives his wound, but would be badly wounded enough that when his horse begins to carry him away, he is not going to be able to control the animal. He will not be able to relay that order that they need to withdraw. So the 147th New York is beginning to find themselves all alone. An early article wrote, uh, an order was given to fall back. This was published in the local newspaper a few weeks after the battle, but it was not heard by the major. And the 56th and 76th on our right fell back, leaving us alone. Uh, in response to this, finding themselves isolated, finding the 55th North Carolina and the 2nd Mississippi already beginning to move on their flanks, the 55th almost already threatening their rear, uh, they responded by pulling at least two of the companies uh, that were on the other side of the fence line facing west, pulling two of those companies onto the fence line and essentially forming a small L, uh, refusing their line, it's called. And so Pierce would write, Company A and F were over the rail fence in a cornfield until the Rebs came on our flank. When they came back on the side, most of our regiment was on. Uh, all of this time, there was a continual roar of musketry. So it's chaotic. They're beginning to realize we're out here all alone. They pull two companies back over the line. At this same time, uh, the 42nd Mississippi began to move on Hall's battery. And Hall, uh, it appears, believed that all of his supports were gone. The 147th New York, as they moved into position, many of them lay down and fired into the wheat, trying to minimize uh, the targets that they presented. And so they were firing from uh, lying down. And it appears that when the 56th Pennsylvania and the 76th New York withdrew, that Hall believed most of his supports were gone. Uh, but the 42nd Mississippi uh, began taking some pretty concentrated fire from Hall's battery, and many of them began to drift over that direction and try to target them directly. Uh, Hall would report after the battle, he said, in 25 minutes from the time we opened fire, a column of the enemy's infantry charged up a ravine on our right flank, probably the railroad cut, the shallower part beyond the ridge line, within 60 yards of my right piece. Uh, when they commenced shooting down my horses and wounding my men. And it's important to remember that one of the biggest threats for an artillery unit are when infantry get close enough to begin to target the horses directly. Uh, you can use anti-infantry personnel on a battle line, but if you have some skirmishers spread out and uh, taking good cover, uh, they essentially can be unopposed as they fire on you. And if they begin targeting your horses, if they begin killing your horses, you're going to have a very difficult time withdrawing your cannons if you get in any trouble. That is uh, the particular reason that that happened. Uh, it appears that Lieutenant Pierce uh, was part of Company C, and they were over here near the left. He would write, uh, that when the fire slowed in his front because elements of the 42nd Mississippi began to drift that well way, he said, I moved my men forward a few yards further to the crest of the ridge with the men of Company C and discovered a line of Confederate skirmishers on our front, advancing from the valley up a slope toward a rail fence, firing as they advanced toward Hall's battery. And so these two companies, C and G, would begin to fire into those skirmishers trying to help protect uh, Hall's line. Still, it appears that Hall was not aware of the presence, the full presence of the 147th New York. He would be very critical of the infantry that fell back. Uh, he was not aware of the fact that they had been ordered back, but he thought even if they had been ordered back, that he was essentially stranded out there by this order to withdraw. But it appears that Hall, when he began to finally withdraw, realizing that he was not going to be able to hold that ground and keep his pieces, that he needed to fall back along with his supports. It appears that the 147th New York was still out here. 
mostly lying down, firing a prone. Now, at this point, this fighting has gone on probably an additional 10 to 15 minutes. In the 147th New York, all alone in that time, the 2nd Mississippi beginning to move on their flank, the 55th North Carolina threatening them from behind. Uh, still, uh, no one from the 147th New York was really sure what they were supposed to be doing. Major Harney had received no orders to withdraw. He knew that the other two companies had, but he did not realize that it was an ordered uh, withdrawal. That may be some evidence that suggests that the withdrawal was a little bit more on the chaotic side as well. Harney, it appears, began to gather some of the surviving captains and officers along the line and began to discuss what exactly they should do, whether they should stay out there or whether they needed to get out of town. Around the same time, it appears that General Wadsworth uh, comes back to this side of the field and begins to notice that the 147th New York is still out here. And he finds one of his staff officers and asks, why are they still out there? I gave an order for them to withdraw. And uh, his adjutant, uh, T.E. Ellsworth, wrote, Wadsworth asked me what that regiment was doing up there said he had given orders some time ago for those troops to be withdrawn and directed me to go and withdraw them. And he <laughs> rode out here. He was talking about how dangerous that order was. At this point, he's feeling the pressure from the flanks, and he would find Major Harney and say, it's time to move. And Harney would give the order very quickly, in retreat, double quick, run. <laughs> Pretty clear. <laughs> Pretty clear that it was time to get out. They are in a pretty dangerous position at this point. They are at risk of being surrounded. The 42nd Mississippi, it appears, is beginning to move further into the cut. As we said, Hall's battery is beginning to try to get out of the way. The 54th 5th North Carolina is threatening them from behind. Uh, the retreat of the 147th was pretty chaotic. Uh, it appears that when the retreat was given by, uh, order was given by Major Harney, that he told the men to essentially ditch everything with the exception of their weapons and their cartridge boxes. It's one of the reasons why it seems that they did not have any food for the next two days, that essentially when the order was given, it was make yourself as light as possible for uh, the rest of the action. So, uh, some went directly back, it appears. Uh, at risk of the 55th North Carolina on their flank, but they still would essentially bolt directly back, avoiding the railroad cut, uh, and going straight back to the woods on Seminary Ridge. Others, it appeared, tried to move through the railroad cut, or at least go down into the cut, and over that way, away from Davis's brigade. Some of the soldiers uh, from uh, the 147th who got into the railroad cut uh, got the, stuck. They said that a lot of soldiers, particularly the wounded, had kind of moved down into the cut uh, to try to escape the battle. They became congested and clogged. Some of them were able to get out and continue retreating on the other side uh, of the, the cut and eventually even maybe on the other side of the Chambersburg Pike. But some of them got stuck in the cut, uh, the cut and a handful were captured. Uh, maybe even as high as, uh, almost as high as 70 men. I think that's probably a little high, but a pretty significant number were captured. We do have a letter surviving uh, from a soldier who was captured and uh, talked about being sent to the rear and put under guard for a few days. He said it was interesting. He said he saw a lot of the rebel generals uh, when he was captured. He saw General Lee and jo uh, General Longstreet. He said that General Lee looked like an old gray rat. <laughs> Not the uh, kindest uh, praise for General Lee, uh, but they were uh, paroled essentially. They took an oath uh, vowing that they would not take up arms against the Confederate States of America until they had been officially exchanged as prisoners. And a few days later uh, were sent back and they would rejoin uh, their regiment once they were uh, formally exchanged by the two sides. But it does appear that uh, at least you know, fairly sizable number of, of the missing uh, from the 147th New York were captured when they got stuck here in the railroad cut. Uh, on July 1st, uh, the 147th went in with 380 men, and by the end of the day, 
79 were present at roll call. It's a massive, massive percentage of casualties. Most of those casualties, almost entirely, are going to be suffered during the fighting that we're talking about that took place right out here. Cutler wrote in his official report, the loss of this gallant regiment was fearful at this point. Two officers killed and 10 wounded, 42 men killed and 153 wounded, 207 out of 380 men and officers within half an hour. Very, very high numbers of casualties. I think it's important to remember that these are not just numbers. Uh, these are people. Uh, people who would lose their lives or who would have their lives forever altered uh, by what they experienced here. And Pierce recollected uh, about the retreat. He said, as I started with my men to the rear, I found Edwin Aylesworth mortally wounded who begged me not to leave him. I stopped and with Sergeant Peter Schutz, assisted him to his feet and tried to carry him. Uh, one other officer described this incident and it appears that he had been wounded pretty badly in the hip and it was apparent that he was not going to uh, survive. He said, uh, I tried to carry him but I could not and had to lay him down. His piteous appeal, don't leave me boys, has rung in my ears and lived in my memory these five and twenty years. Was not able uh, to save his comrade. Uh, Aylesworth would die here and he would also go on to say that later that afternoon in some of the afternoon fighting, uh, Peter Schutz who tried to assist him would also be killed. So many of these soldiers uh, sacrificed themselves here in serious fighting uh, and this fighting uh, would be very consequential for how the rest of the first day would play out. It would shape the Battle of Gettysburg and shape the, uh, the rest of the war and continue to impact uh, the country to this day as the, the war has shaped our country. So what we're going to do now, we're going to move from here, try to get out of the sun for at least a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about some of the consequences uh, of their battle action. We'll move uh, a little bit and then uh, take a brief pause, talk about the consequences, and then we'll move on and talk about their afternoon fighting. Along the way, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, try to answer them. But before we move, do we have any questions about the train? Yeah. Um, what happened with Paul's men? Did, did he, uh, we'll, uh, he able we'll to talk get back? about that at, uh, at the next okay. stop a little bit. Yeah. The fire that was so devastating to the Union, that the unit up here on the ridge, was that, I mean, was that artillery or was that really just the Confederate infantry? I think it's them? mostly Confederate infantry. By and large, the Confederate artillery will probably target Hall's battery mostly. There's probably some artillery uh, involved, but uh, it appears the most intense is going to be the, the flanking fire from the Confederate infantry. Yep. When you ask for exchange, would they get the prisoners back and they would exchange men? Um, I don't think, I think they would essentially be paroled first and they'd take that oath to not take up arms until they would essentially trade numbers back and forth. That's what I mean, they would um, trade numbers. Yeah, that they would when they, after they paroled them, the, the captain, uh, the, this uh, soldier, I think he, I'm trying to remember his rank, but he, uh, he would write that they were sent uh, under a white flag of truce and kind of handed over, but at that point there was not the official, that's not even the official, hey, we've exchanged numbers for numbers. That's just, hey, these are your guys. We've paroled them. They're your problem now. So, uh, One other question. Why was it that um, <clears throat> you said the Union, we couldn't see them mm -hmm. until they were right on on top of us, mm -hmm. the Confederates? Why could they, why did the Confederates know where we were? That's a good, uh, that's a good question. I would imagine that in part uh, they can see uh, further over, over uh, on that part of the line a little bit better but they're also just advancing and uh, they kind of know uh, that someone is in their front uh, they're not entirely sure of how how far away that's yeah that's a good question uh, I did not look at a ton of Confederate accounts I just kind of read what Davis said um, but I didn't see a lot of what the individual soldiers were talking about what they saw Isn't messages from the Carolina 
All right, we'll move now. We'll go back along the road and put a shade. We'll take a, a brief pause here, catch our breaths, and talk about uh, the significance of the action. Uh, even out here, you, know, you can see the lay of the land being on the back crest of the ridge. It's hard to see over to where we were. Uh, you can see that this position is probably a little bit more advantageous to the ground immediately to the left. This is going to be a pretty small part uh, of the battle action here on the first day. Very small. So I want to try to capture how this is going to relate to the rest of the first day. The first uh, impact that the, uh, the stand of the 147th New York certainly has is that they enable Hall's battery uh, to get out to withdraw most of their guns and uh, to make it back and to reform a little closer to the seminary and to continue their role in shelling uh, the advancing uh, Confederate infantry. Uh, Hall would remove five or six of his guns and he said, as the last piece of the battery was coming away, all its horses were shot. He would say he contemplated uh, taking uh, going himself and trying to recover the guns. Uh, Wadsworth did eventually find him and tell him, reform your battery uh, in the rear. And uh, then he said, I tried to send a sergeant with five men after the piece as the rest of the guns were trying to get away. And he said all of whom were wounded or taken prisoner. So he did have to lose one of his guns. But five of the six escaped, continue to play uh, a part. Uh, the second and perhaps most important uh, part of their action is that it delayed the, conf uh, the Confederate advance significantly enough. When we said, you know, they begin their fighting, the Iron Brigade is not on the field yet. They're moving, they're getting close, they're moving into position, but they will buy precious time that shores up the Union left as well. They will also slow down. Uh, Joe Davis's brigade uh, from moving towards that side of the battlefield. Uh, once the, the 56th Pennsylvania and the 76th New York begin to give way, uh, in many ways, the 55th North Carolina moving in the fields behind you here, uh, they're not necessarily moving directly towards the uh, 147th New York. They're heading towards the flank of, at this point, the entire the new Union uh, battle line. So uh, they are threatening that. Many of Davis's brigade uh, will move towards uh, the railroad cut, move into the railroad cut, thinking that it offered some uh, defensive positions, uh, both from Cutler's men who are in the woods over there. Those, you know, the wood line extends probably a little bit too far, but Cutler's men will be uh, in the woods along the railroad cut. Uh, but also, they think they can use it uh, to put pressure on the Union left while having excellent cover from them. So that's going to slow Davis's men uh, down to the point where they're doing that while the Iron Brigade is going into position and importantly while there's a reserve of the 6th Wisconsin. The 6th Wisconsin and the 14th Brooklyn and the 95th New York are going to combine <laughs> and make a famous charge on the railroad cut, recognizing that the railroad cut poses a really significant threat to the new uh, Union line uh, over there, threatening uh, essentially to flank the entire Union line. Uh, the 6th Wisconsin and Colonel Rufus Dawes, the 14th Brooklyn and the 95th New York will together uh, participate uh, in a famous charge that will lead to uh, the capture of a lot of prisoners and essentially send Davis's brigade, push them back here where they'll withdraw all the way beyond uh, what was at the time uh, the Wills House, not the Wills House downtown, but the Wills family farmhouse that you can see uh, poking up over there. So the, the charge that the 6th Wisconsin and the rest of Cutler's Brigade will make will be what finally pushes Davis back. But that is not going to happen 
uh, without the stand of the 147th New York. If the 147th New York begins to withdraw too quickly and Davis's uh, brigade can move uh, too quickly onto uh, the Union left, there's a chance that the Iron Brigade really does not get uh, to deploy uh, the way that they do and also uh, that they would begin to just overrun. The, the 6th Wisconsin wouldn't even be really in reserve yet in a position to be moved over there. So the 147th New York in their stand is going to be really, uh, really significant. It will buy the time for the charge. It will essentially push pause on the fighting in the morning. Now, one of the interesting things about the Battle of Gettysburg is that neither of the two armies, especially for the Union Army after Reynolds is killed, neither of the two armies is really certain that they're supposed to be fighting here. Uh, General Lee does not arrive on the field until 2.30 in the afternoon. General Lee does not arrive until midnight. And uh, even though there are people formally in command, Doubleday is in command of the field for the Union uh, uh, Army until the Union 11th Corps under General Howard arrives, uh, it's still not entirely apparent who is in charge, who is really make the, making the decisions about where they should be, especially as it relates to where General Meade wants them to be, where they should be in relation to the, the rest of the Union Army. It's interesting, Buford sends a telegraph, uh, excuse me, a message, a courier, directly to General Meade around 3.30 in the afternoon on the 1st, and he sends, uh, he says, essentially, nobody seems to be in charge. And then he says, and I quote, we need help now. I think that really captures the, the sense of what's going on here. Uh, but the pause that will settle here will be in large part because of the stand of the 147th New York buying time. The survivors, the few survivors, around 80 men or so, would take some time to fill up uh, their canteens near the town. And then uh, they would be ordered back out to this position. As we said, Davis and his men would uh, withdraw back beyond the Wills House in the distance, they would come and occupy this ridge line. And the survivors of the 147th New York would be on the right flank, out in the middle of the field, essentially, uh, probably uh, a little over halfway between here and the fence, at least. Uh, they would be out there, and uh, that's going to be an extremely vulnerable position once again. Because around noon, early in the afternoon, Latest. Confederates under Robert Rhodes will go into position on Oak Hill in the distance behind him. They will stretch uh, all along uh, from the, the far tree line. Uh, you can see the tree line closest to the Mummersburg Road, closest to the Peace Light. Uh, there are two smaller cavalry monuments. They'll stretch probably from that part of the line at least all the way down the back side of the hill. Rhodes has in his division around 8,000 men. That's almost as large as the entire Union First Corps, which is stretched from out here uh, all the way across the Chambersburg Pike. And the 147th New York find themselves on the right end of the line, finding themselves out there all alone once again. Thankfully, Cutler this time will begin to uh, pull the brigade back fairly quickly into the wood line to try to provide them some cover. Uh, but the 147th New York there fighting uh, would not be over for uh, the, the day. They still have a pretty significant part to play. So what we'll do now, we'll continue to move along the path here, and uh, we'll talk about their afternoon fighting before we come back and conclude at their monument. But I do want to move over to where they fought uh, to also give you a sense of how much these guys are moving. I think that is one of the advantages of having two hours uh, for the battle walk. Is to actually walk where they walked and to get a sense they are covering a lot of ground as well. So uh, we'll move now. If you have any questions along the way, I'd be happy to try to answer. For his command, and uh, he'll pull them back. And there's some a little bit of confusion about what exactly uh, the... The, the way that Cutler faces, um, it appears like most likely 
Uh, the 147th New York and the 56th Pennsylvania will be in the wood line facing north, facing Oak Hill, and that the rest uh, will face west uh, in the wood line, facing out essentially the way they were before the threat from Oak Hill. But the woods are small enough that uh, Cutler is not able to move all of his command into the woods and have them shift uh, to face the threat entirely from Oak Hill. They also have to keep in mind that Davis's brigade is on the other side of the hill as well. But the 147th New York was on the right part of the line facing north at the edge of the wood line. So very close to where we are right now. Uh, they will participate. Their uh, last major role in the fighting, uh, they will participate in the repulse of Alfred Iverson's uh, famous uh, botched attack on this part of the line. Uh, initially, they, they probably would have been the end of the line here uh, when Baxter's brigade uh, moves uh, along the uh, back side of the ridge. Initially, the Confederate attack from Rhodes Division will uh, target the back side of the ridge. That's why uh, the uh, next kind of Union troops in line will, attack, will uh, move into position on the back side of the ridge and will face the Mummasburg Road in our front and fight along it parallel. If the Confederate attack from Oak Hill had been uh, entirely uh, coordinated and well executed, we said 8,000 men up there, uh, five different brigades up there. If it had been coordinated and well executed, they probably should have had no problem of pushing the Union Army from this position. They essentially arrived right on the flank uh, but again, even when they're going into position, there's some confusion on Robert Rhodes' part about what exactly he should do because he doesn't have specific orders. It's unclear whether they're supposed to be even fighting at all. Uh, the arrival of the 11th Corps beyond to the north of town and the fields below us uh, will kind of push Rhodes into action. But when that happens, uh, his attacks will be uh, kind of haphazard, disorganized, and will result in uh, very little success for the Confederates. And for Alfred Iverson's brigade, uh, who the 147th New York uh, would help repulse, it would end in absolute disaster. Initially, uh, as Baxter and his men go into so uh, to, to position behind uh, us here on the back side of the ridge, uh, they will repulse uh, the first attack from Rhodes coming on the back side of the hill which was launched by uh, O'Neill's brigade. They'll fight along the Emmitsburg Road. O'Neill will be pushed back. And the next part of the attack, the second of three brigades to launch an attack from Oak Hill, will be Alfred Iverson and his North Carolinians. Uh, at this point, Iverson will make a couple key mistakes, very costly mistakes. One, and this isn't entirely Iverson's fault, but they're not coordinating with O'Neill either in timing, but no one even speaks uh, from O'Neill and Iverson's commands to communicate that this is what happened to us over there. They kind of launch without any communication about what had happened. Oh, it appears that Iverson believes this part of the line is entirely empty, and that would make Cutler's line here in large part the target. A, a great comment. This is the fence line that would have continued all the way up uh, over uh, the fields where the 147th uh, made their stand out where we were earlier. Uh, it is noon, but I do want to take just a few minutes and wrap up here at their monument because uh, we do get a, a good view of where they finally uh, withdrew to. Uh, Cutler writes that after the repulse of uh, Daniel and as he pulled back to the behind uh, almost to the crest of the, the ridge there, obscured by the trees. He said, I received an order to send three regiments to aid in repelling the enemy near the seminary. I immediately sent the 14th Brooklyn and the 147th and 76th New York. Uh, because he's saying near the seminary, uh, it appears that they were probably on the other side of the Chambersburg Pike. They were supporting that artillery battery. It's a little hard to see, but you can see a, a tablet out there and some
cannons on this side of the pike. Oh, no. they, they could have been on, on this side of the pike. It's hard to tell where exactly they were. Uh, without ammunition at that point, they did finally get some ammunition, uh, but it would not be long uh, before the uh, Confederates renewed their push near the seminary, before the, uh, the 11th Corps line had already collapsed and other parts of the line renewed push from Oak Hill was causing the uh, parts of the 1st Corps line to begin uh, to collapse. And so Cutler uh, would very soon after they moved into position here uh, receive orders to withdraw through the town and to reform on Cemetery Hill. And that is where uh, the 147th New York would end on July 1st, uh, along with the rest of Cutler's brigade. The 7th Indiana, who had been uh, held in reserve far south, rejoined the regiment men. Uh, the next few days, uh, they will see uh, fighting on Culp's Hill. The 147th New York is one of the few units that really sees significant fighting on all three days of the battle, along with the rest of Cutler's brigade, uh, brigade the 7th Indiana, uh, being the exception. Uh, but uh, I did want to just pause and end with the monument dedication uh, because it was dedicated on July 1st, 1888, the 25th anniversary, and it touches on some of the issues related to July 1st. Uh, Captain uh, Lieutenant Pierce, uh, J.B. Pierce, who's given us many of the quotes that we've uh, heard from on this program, he was one of the speakers who gave the historical account of the battle the role of the 147th New York. His research uh, is very uh, valuable in preserving what they did here. Uh, but he would touch on the fact that July 1st uh, is so often a forgotten part of this battle. He would say at one point, uh, Gallant Sickles, in his address a year ago, denominates the first day's battle a preliminary skirmish. But for the heroism and staying qualities of Reynolds and his men on the first day, General Sickles would never had the opportunity to make the awesome boast that the Third Corps, his corps, fought the Battle of Gettysburg. He's making the point that what the Union Army did out here uh, is hugely consequential for how the rest of the battle comes. Uh, the Union Army does not retain the high ground south of town. Uh, if the 1st Corps 